Okay. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, again, we appreciate the uh, gracious invitation to share and, uh, as you say, extend our, our very collegial and collaborative partnership between our ICs, that, uh, uh, which we're looking forward to uh, ongoing synergies and opportunity to get uh, input from this um, the expertise uh, gathered in your, your council uh, that complements uh, and helps us in our directions. Uh, just to outline a couple things, uh, how uh, this, these programs fit into our overall uh, portfolio of both uh, scientific priorities and fiscal management, uh, and then a couple of highlights about uh, some interfaces, and we'll throw in a couple other pieces where I'm hopeful that collectively we can think about and brainstorm and strategize about uh, additional uh, synergies and collaborations. I, I always uh, sort of start uh, with um, some guiding principles uh, uh, that uh, relate to our uh, NHLBI mission that kind of keeps us uh, grounded, uh, in which uh, a, a big part of uh, our fiscal uh, and strategic approach uh, centers around um, investigator-initiated fundamental discovery science really is the bedrock uh, upon which we think about these particular uh, institute um, solicited and initiated sort of large programmatic efforts uh, and our uh, ongoing efforts to maintain a balanced portfolio that spans basic translational clinical and population science and, and how this, uh, again, fits into those enduring principles. Um, uh, and a key uh, sort of sacrosanct element that I always use as a touchstone uh, is the integration of training. Uh, a diverse new generation of leaders, of science as part of this, and again, uh, relevant to uh, our collaborative efforts in this genomics and data science space uh, that we're exploring. Uh, and then, um, uh, probably actually more, more relevant to you on this uh, particular point about implementation science. In some sense, I guess kind of what you do with CSER and Insight and thinking about uh, how this technology and our findings and our new knowledge actually penetrates uh, to uh, in a very pragmatic uh, but strategic and evidence-based way uh, into practice that influences how patients are cared for and uh, has public health impact. And I think uh, that's that grounding uh, that both our institutes need to continue to put forward uh, such that we're always connecting with the public and the public impact of the discoveries uh, that we fund. And then finally, a passion of mine uh, uh, to in innovative evidence-based elimination of health inequities, uh, which again uh, still sta stirs, uh, stays as a backdrop, and I think is still very relevant, uh, quite frankly, to uh, the programs we're pursuing now. Uh, uh, just as a, a brief uh, overview, uh, uh, certainly uh, this council is familiar with the trials and tribulations uh, related to our budget, uh, but uh, this just goes to, to show some of the things that we've been doing uh, in our uh, multi year perspective modeling to try to again, bend the curve in promoting investigator-initiated discovery science, uh, particularly R01-funded research at our institute, uh, in which we're trying to eke up that pay line despite uh, fiscal strength constraints. Uh, and we're making some headway, uh, obviously facilitated by the, the boost up of the $2 billion uh, from FY16. And I guess uh, we remain hopeful, uh, Eric, uh, uh, as to what Congress may do in this election year. Uh, but uh, given the unpredictability of that, uh, I'll stay away that, from that in a public session. <laughs> uh, but uh, as we think about those strategies, one of the elements um, has been uh, a strategic planning or what we call strategic visioning process we've been embarked on for the last uh, year and a half or so uh, to help uh, provide uh, greater framing and focus and uh, strategic guidance on our institute uh, solicitation uh, and institute uh, uh, major programs that uh, fall into these four major broad goal areas around understanding uh, human biology, reducing uh, the impact of disease, uh, promoting translation from early to late implementation science, and, and then our uh, stewardship of the workforce and resources. And uh, it was a sort of uh, atypical process for NHLBI that uh, used crowdsourcing uh, and solicited from all 50 states and 42 countries around the world to help us think about what are the most compelling questions and critical challenges we should develop. And uh, indeed, we're uh, encouraged by the response we got. Relevant uh, to the presentation today, uh, there were a number of things that over the course of time 
uh, came in that aligned very much with uh, um, a direction that I know uh, Eric's been pursuing since uh, your, your strategic plan from several years ago uh, in the genomic medicine space and where we've been uh, talking uh, along since uh, I arrived. Um, uh, I th see a convergence in this space that uh, was really uh, also bubbled up in the strategic visioning process around the opportunities that exist in precision medicine within our portfolio uh, and um, uh, a sense from our community uh, that we need uh, to, to uh, leverage these new technologies for uh, understanding individual uh, factors that account for variances in treatment and response uh, as, as strategies for both prevention and treatment uh, and uh, incorporating that into our, our research agenda. Uh, such that uh, we can be more effective at predicting outcomes, uh, tailoring treatments, um, uh, refining our approach to clinical trials, uh, and really extending uh, the scale, scope, and depth of our population science. Um, there, there are some challenges that come from considering how we might implement this uh, related to uh, some elements of, of how we have typically collected data on a uh, R01 by R01 or grant by grant or even cohort by cohort basis uh, over the decades uh, and uh, where these things often remain behind uh, isolated firewalls uh, and yet the increasing explosion of data uh, that uh, we, we are seeing, some of which uh, our two institutes have, have catalyzed together, uh, particularly with uh, all the sequencing efforts of late, uh, that uh, particularly the whole genome sequencing efforts. Uh, and the fragmentation of that uh, data generation and uh, accessibility uh, and uh, utility um, uh, in moving uh, those sorts of data sets around. Uh, and so uh, uh, we, we certainly look forward to, to ongoing partnership with uh, Genome uh, uh, around uh, some of these areas of open science uh, and uh, how we can get uh, more facile uh, and nimble um, uh, data uh, integration uh, and movement across data, set, uh, uh, data sets uh, that we're both, uh, our, both of our institutes are gen uh, generating. Uh, similarly, again, this uh, theme of training uh, and uh, leveraging uh, advances in data science and inviting them into the biomedical uh, arena uh, and vice versa uh, and uh, the opportunities that exist uh, for our collaboration and synergies in that space. Uh, and as a uh, organ disease-based institute, uh, a call out uh, for, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, perhaps a human phenome project uh, in which um, uh, we uh, uh, say as a clinician scientist uh, uh, hope that our, our phenomics catches up uh, with our genomics technology and, 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 and that we seize this opportunity uh, to refine uh, basically the clinical taxonomy uh, that uh, we all kind of grew up with at a much deeper uh, and more fundamental uh, way. Um, and I think uh, uh, we've gotten quite a, a, uh, a tailwind uh, provided by the, the, the President uh, and his vision for a precision medicine, which I think uh, gave uh, uh, us both a, a boost. Uh, certainly, um, uh, Eric and I were shoulder and shoulder uh, uh, in the uh, implementation of um, trying to go from what a statement in February uh, to uh, a rollout of um, 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 projects uh, here this fall uh, at the speed of light, it seemed like, uh, at, at periods of time for the government to move. But uh, indeed, we're moving and making progress. And uh, it's great that uh, uh, Eric Dishman uh, is both here and on board, and uh, we'll, we'll detail a lot of that for you. Uh, we, we, we're excited uh, by the opportunity that comes uh, from a space in which uh, folks like uh, Terra Manolio have been around, uh, NHLBI has been uh, uh, having these iconic um, uh, longitudinal community-based cohort studies that have collected data and really set a paradigm uh, for so many years uh, on the ability to predict uh, who's at risk of a heart attack and identify things like risk factors. And now to overlay the, uh, the greater depth of data that uh, we now can put together uh, to maybe hopefully refine that original framing around risk score, which uh, helped me, uh, Terry, probably hasn't changed in about 30 years. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll get something that can, can beat it out uh, and it's in predictive value now that we have all this data. At least that's the promise. Um, 
Uh, let's see if we can actually bring it to fruition. And hopefully uh, one of those elements is uh, the, the ability to, to create uh, resources that facilitate uh, the more effective mining uh, of that data, uh, the scaling uh, of that data uh, in ways that uh, we can think about it as a broader resource, a data commons, if you will, a shared resource uh, of, 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 of a virtual uh, public good, uh, something that I think uh, the NIH should be um, uh, involved as a, a steward in creating uh, that serves um, for knowledge generation, uh, innovation, uh, scientific advances uh, as a sort of living ecosystem, uh, one in which uh, there's a, a communal space uh, that engages um, people from a variety of disciplines and uh, perspectives uh, toward uh, asking uh, and answering important questions. And, uh, that's uh, uh, open and one in which uh, um, uh, whether you're a, a participant in a cohort or uh, a, a member of council uh, that you can uh, gain from those uh, insights and be engaged. Uh, so this is the vision that I think is starting to emerge. I think uh, certainly uh, Eric and I uh, share some of these things and uh, are, are engaged uh, internally uh, with discussions about you know how um, NIH probably should be uh, position to uh, kind of create this kind of discovery uh, sandbox uh, of these data and data sets in a responsible way uh, that uh, obviously honors privacy um, and controlled access uh, restrictions. Uh, but as we look at the future, uh, we see the potential, particularly in the HLBI space, of reimagining um, uh, clinical research uh, that aligns with our mission uh, as we know it, uh, enabling rich data collection, uh, it facilitates cohorts of uh, some phenotypes uh, of interest like uh, early onset MI, new onset atrial fibrillation, hypertension, uh, even monogenic disorders like sickle cell disease uh, and potential modifiers, uh, asthma, COPD, uh, et cetera, uh, and apply deep analytics uh, to predict uh, disease risk uh, and identify novel molecular pathobiological mediators. Uh, and uh, for that to then translate into a space of launching clinical trials with uh, predetermined eligibility, uh, predictive risk profiles, and embedded long-term um, uh, follow-up, perhaps in existing health systems. And again, uh, related to eMERGE and CSER and IGNITE, I can't keep up with all your uh, acronyms, uh, but I think there's opportunities as you do these uh, proof of principles uh, that the disease-based ICs uh, can, can learn. Uh, and again, we'll continue to work together uh, toward uh, this convergent vision. Uh, certainly for us, uh, part of uh, 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 advancing into this space um, uh, is to leverage the class cohorts that we've had uh, and to um, contemplate um, a, a transomic uh, approach for precision medicine, our top med program, to link uh, the, the deep phenotyping characterization of heart, lung, blood, sleep phenotypes in our cohorts uh, with the multi-level uh, omics that uh, this institute uh, has been at the forefront in creating uh, the techniques and technologies and approaches to. Uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, uh, again, an opportunity for synergy and a partnership uh, where we can continue to hopefully push the envelope uh, and how to, to really um, uh, expand and extend uh, these genomic phenomic um, uh, analyses uh, at a, a larger and larger scale. And I'm sure Adam will get into uh, the potential um, collaborative synergies that have come through your, your complex trait program. Uh, but uh, there have been some um, uh, piloting, if you will, of, of this approach of, of linking the multiple layers of uh, things that are happening at the epigenome, the transcriptome, and uh, and um, uh, DNA level, uh, even in Framingham, uh, work that Dan Levy's done, even in the space of our um, hypertension phenotype and looking at the multiple uh, layers of omics uh, to start to identify um, networks uh, and potential mediators that um, otherwise we may have missed um, through uh, any one approach alone, uh, taking the system strategy. And so we're hoping that the top med uh, can continue to extend this beyond a single cohort, uh, but leverage um, the various cohorts of over 100,000, actually a couple hundred thousand uh, individuals that uh, currently 
uh, have been characterized and for whom we have uh, a number of these biospecimens within the NHLBI portfolio, uh, such that uh, we uh, 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 take advantage of these uh, phenotypes and in indeed continue to expand them, uh, perhaps uh, with personal uh, sensor data uh, information, uh, continue to layer the omics and extend beyond uh, just sort of the GWAS uh, uh, genotyping that's already been done for uh, over a decade um, and um, uh, continue to, to use the various modalities uh, uh, inclusive of meta um, metabolomics, microbiome, uh, and other uh, elements uh, in ways that, that builds out our capacity to, to characterize the determinants of heart, lung, blood, sleep disorders. And then to, to put this data in a space that promotes uh, greater analytic, new analytic methods and approaches uh, um, and uh, uh, it, it happens in a space uh, that is again communal uh, in bringing together expertise that might uh, reside clearly outside of heart, lung, blood, speed, uh, sleep specialists. Um, and in that regard, um, uh, I was uh, uh, aware of this paper that um, uh, I thought was apropos of this uh, dialogue uh, with this institute and actually some of the statements uh, made earlier about how we can uh, work together as we uh, develop these uh, data sets, uh, a paper that uh, Isaac Cohane's group uh, put out uh, that related to gen genetic misdiagnosis uh, and the potential for health disparities in which, uh, in the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, one of the entities in our uh, uh, portfolio, uh, that, you know, leaders like Cricket Seidman et al., have uh, provided a, a great understanding uh, of, in terms of sarcomeric uh, defects, uh, that now when that rolls out uh, to patient care, uh, that uh, um, um, unfortunately often reflects uh, the sort of skewed distribution uh, and, quite frankly, Eurocentric nature of a lot of the studies and genomic resources uh, can be problematic uh, when these uh, um, um, data and knowledge are brought to bear uh, in African-American uh, patients and uh, the potential uh, to misclassify uh, something as benign or pathogenic uh, without really the, the evidence base uh, to do so, particularly given, again, the, the different uh, allele frequencies and the very, across various uh, ancestral groups. And really, I think, a call out to us to, to ensure uh, that as uh, the NIH uh, fulfills its mission to turn discovery science into the health of the nation, uh, that we, we uh, create resources uh, that are reflective of the diversity uh, of our uh, great nation. Uh, and um, to be explicit about it, um, that's something we've been fairly intentional uh, about uh, uh, in top mid uh, as we've partnered with uh, Genome and uh, a number of the sequencing centers uh, to ensure that we really take this opportunity to expand uh, that uh, diversity of populations in which we, we start to understand um, the, the whole spectrum of genomic uh, variation. And uh, um, uh, not, not solely in some narrow sense of political correctness, uh, but as a, a matter of understanding uh, the human family uh, and understanding um, uh, uh, population histories and, and, and how uh, those have an influence uh, on predispositions to, to health and disease. So I think it's a fundamentally a scientific uh, issue, uh, not only a, a matter of, uh, of doing uh, the right thing, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, we've been diligent and, and, quite frankly, leveraged the legacy of the NHLBI has had of, of having diverse cohorts, whether it's the Jackson Heart Study, uh, Strong Heart Study, Native Americans, uh, the multi-ethnic uh, uh, atherosclerosis study um, uh, that has captured uh, these groups, as well as uh, the various other investigator-initiated cohorts. Uh, so in addition to that diversity seen on the, the, the right, uh, we also have gone across uh, the various phenotypes of heart, lung, blood, and sleep complex traits. And again, I think this is where uh, we have a lot of uh, synergistic uh, opportunities with what uh, Genome's been doing. I'm also hopeful uh, that uh, we, we start to think about um, how we can uh, uh, more effectively um, 
promote access uh, to these different data types, um, data elements, uh, and data sources to ask and answer um, fundamental questions, uh, particularly in these multidimensional uh, data sets, and uh, creating that uh, discovery sandbox uh, where all that can come together. It's obviously not a trivial matter, um, but we're, we're also hopeful that we can work with Genome uh, that, quite frankly, has created a number of these um, data resources to think about how do we um, promote and enable and facilitate uh, a more seamless, uh, integrated uh, analytical strategy that uh, is, is less encumbered um, by uh, what has traditionally been kind of an upload, download uh, sort of world of, of data use and, and one that uh, can potentially uh, leverage uh, the capabilities of, of cloud computing uh, where we move and go to the data, uh, go to tools that are, are accessible uh, and as ways to, uh, again, uh, promote discovery science. Uh, in this regard, uh, I was again intrigued by this uh, a recent paper that came out of StarNet uh, that again looked at uh, heart, lung, blood, sleep phenotypes, in this case uh, cardiometabolic uh, risk loci, uh, and leveraged uh, not only sort of GWAS data, but obviously uh, tissue expression data, um, and uh, uh, did that in a way that aligned the uh, GWAS hits, uh, EQTLs, uh, with cis-trans regulatory uh, pathways and uh, identification of networks uh, to get uh, some further insights uh, into uh, the determinants of certain outcomes. And, and so it, 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 it is always kind of reaffirming that uh, intuitively it kind of makes sense that you might uh, discover not only loss of function, gain of function for PCSK9, uh, but that there might indeed be intergenic uh, regulatory regions that uh, were identified uh, that, uh, again, are important in modulating uh, LDL and, and risk, uh, and uh, indeed are now drug targets uh, for a new therapeutic. Uh, and so, uh, to me, these are some of the elements of bringing those data sets uh, seamlessly together that I think we could probably facilitate uh, in a more user-friendly way than, than currently exists. And, I'm hoping that a, a data commons kind of concept uh, helps make that more likely to occur. Uh, similarly, uh, this uh, paper that Eric Schatt uh, was part of, and uh, uh, certainly he uh, presented some of this uh, when he visited us at our uh, last uh, council meeting, uh, talking about uh, the, the work uh, that he had done, uh, in this case, uh, in, in childhood diseases, um, uh, and, and the notion of, of resilience and, and a human knockout resource. Uh, and as we contemplate uh, top med uh, that can leverage uh, existing cohorts where we're hopeful to have whole genome sequencing uh, with a goal of at least 100,000 uh, individuals, and uh, Eric will talk about, uh, um, Eric D., uh, we'll talk about uh, um, PMI uh, of a million plus. Uh, and uh, we already have uh, colleagues uh, at the VA with uh, MVP uh, that soon um, will we'll have uh, the kind of information uh, in which uh, we should be able to understand that, that same example of a misdiagnosis of all those sarcomeric genes um, to really know uh, it, that uh, it was that really benign, not just on allele frequency, but What's the echo, MRI, and EKG uh, of that variant of at least uh, perhaps 100 people, uh, 150 people over the age of 60, uh, so that when we're, you are uh, counseling that individual of 25, uh, what's the likelihood that uh, they'll have a long QT and sudden death or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, with a little bit more evidence base? And creating that capability is, I think, something that uh, we'd love to see and work with Genome uh, to create. Uh, and so we're, we're starting to see this notion of bring together these multiple layers and levels uh, of data, uh, all of which uh, NIH has already invested in, uh, but making it uh, not a series of one-off projects and programs, but uh, something that uh, indeed can uh, become synthesized, integrated uh, in a seamless digital way uh, such that um, uh, those who are, are great phenotypers uh, as well as those who are great genomicists 
uh, can leverage it in a way that uh, have an impact on patients and participants. Uh, and it's really with that notion that uh, we look forward to uh, synergies and partnership uh, with NHGRI uh, in helping us uh, fulfill those shared uh, visions and purposes. And be happy to address uh, any questions or hear any comments and feedback you may have for us. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Jeff. Yes, thank you for that presentation. A number of the issues that you touched on have significant ethical, social implications to them. One of the innovative aspects of uh, NHGRI has been that set aside for ELSI research. And I'm wondering whether NHLBI has ever considered uh, anything that would be analogous or perhaps collaboration with NHLBI on that set of issues where there's some uh, synergy. Yeah, that's no, a, a great point. Uh, again, I agree with you. I think that's a terrific opportunity uh, for collaborative synergy, uh, particularly given uh, genome's long track record, history, domain expertise in that space, uh, and the sense that a lot of these things are cross-cutting uh, makes more sense to do that uh, as opposed to a disease uh, or organ basis. And we look forward to that. Uh, uh, Top Med does uh, include uh, on its external panel, uh, actually some of the folks around uh, the, the, this table and, uh, uh, um, you know, um, and that, are, that are in that space, whether it's a, a Wiley Burke or a Ellen Clayton and, and others who are, are thinking about those. So definitely an area of interest uh, of ours. Uh, and quite frankly, in one of the areas that uh, we would love uh, even more interchange uh, relates to one of the cohorts that I mentioned, uh, the Strong Heart Study and uh, uh, Native American populations. And, um, and so uh, the First Nation is, is uh, uh, a, a, an area of, of interest and priority. I was intrigued, uh, Eric, that uh, you talked about some of the outreach efforts you've had uh, in that space. I think that's a, another area where it makes sense for, for NIH in a collaborative and joint way, in a very coherent, single voice way, to think about um, how, how we address that very thoughtfully. Uh, so absolutely, uh, totally agree with you there. So thank you for the presentation. I, I, I really like the, the vision and the way you presented this idea of this data sandbox for, for mining. But I, I noticed that one of the inputs into that sandbox wasn't information we can learn about the connection between genotype and phenotype in model organisms and how that can actually help inform our understanding of biology of variants in, in humans both in health and disease. And so I'm wondering if that's part of your vision and how you, if you want to make any comments on that as well. Yeah, you know, so it's a great point. Uh, I definitely uh, would agree that that sort of comparative genomic uh, element, uh, that evolutionary perspective, if you will, in some ways is consistent with sort of a, a population history uh, appreciation of, of things. And um, uh, I'll defer to another day and, and really to Eric that I think that's one of the areas that we've been uh, in internal dialogue about. Uh, clearly, genome has uh, uh, played a, a leading role in uh, a lot of sequencing across species. And I agree with you, there's a wealth of information there that I think would fit very well uh, within the data commons. You should be able uh, to, to look at a variant and, and uh, or, I don't know, an enhancer region and be able to understand it not only across human population but across species. Uh, in a very seamless sort of way uh, with the phenotypes that have been uh, derived from a, a, a zebrafish as well as from a human being. And uh, certainly, uh, I think all of that's informative in understanding a molecular pathobiology of, of disease. Absolutely. Gary, I'm really glad that you highlighted that paper from uh, the Harvard group on the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and this really vicious cycle of having SES, lower SES, and ethnic background mixed together, resulting in less genetic testing, less research, less information, which means, therefore, it's less useful to them. And it's just, so I think we have to break that cycle Absolutely. quite deliberately and specifically. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, for example, I'm thinking particularly of a resource like ClinVar, which is relying very heavily on clinical laboratory testing, which is being paid for 
and is not open because of how poorly um, served uh, underserved populations are by our insurance system and by a whole variety of other systems um, to be able to get access to this testing. So I think we have to break the cycle quite specifically and deliberately. Yeah. Guess all I could say is amen, brother. <laughs> um, uh, Eric Borwinkle on the phone has a question. Hi, Gary. You know, thank you very much for addressing council. I know you're extremely busy. Uh, I, one comment I have is just wanted to add to enthusiasm about the synergies between the NHGRI CCGC program that Adam's going to talk about and what you did talk about with the OpMed program. And, but then to extend that is how can NHGRI and NHLBI work to broaden other ICs, so you know, these two ICs don't become a, a, a silo, and, and we have silos formed by disease group or phenotype. How can we expand this to make sure that we increase sample size and diversity, but in this case, diversity of disease endpoints? You know, I, I, it's a great comment, and uh, uh, Eric, uh, um, you're pretty adept at um, uh, uh, having multiple ICs uh, support you, so so <laughs> so if there's anyone who knows the answer to that question, it's you. But but in all seriousness, um, uh, I think that's one of the opportunities we have uh, with Top Med is um, um, uh, Eric used the term sort of prototype. Uh, some might call us the, the the canaries in the coal mine. Uh, that uh, I think we 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 can probe and see how this this model is working. Obviously, Eric has done this throughout you know, his tenure, as did Francis, uh, that uh, I think in this space it it's only makes sense uh, to, to do this as partnerships. It's been clear from a lot of the, the queries that you've already had that the potentials are for the synergy with all the other resources that this institute uh, has created. So it's, to me it's a no-brainer. Uh, and, uh, and, and to a certain extent, uh, as you know, Eric, uh, it may derive from the fact that the cohorts also have had that sort of approach. So, um, as you're aware, um, uh, NIA and uh, aging and, and uh, dementia research uh, leverages these same cohorts. Uh, uh, same true for kidney disease. Uh, same for uh, at least the pre-diabetic uh, population that has outcomes. Uh, as we scale these things, I think it becomes almost self-evident that uh, the other ICs need to play in the same sandbox and contribute uh, to its ability to go across. Uh, uh, it'll be a win-win for everybody. Uh, and that's where I think the data commons can help promote that as opposed to a series of IC-specific one-offs. Uh, and, uh, and that's where I'm hoping, I think Eric shares this, uh, uh, we hope that uh, we, we can create this as an enterprise approach. Let me, sorry, I'm going to go to Sharon and then Dan, but let me, I have a direct question that relates to what, there's a lot of Eric's in this, uh, <laughs> yes. what Borwinkle just said, and it relates to what Dishman's going to talk about this afternoon. Gary, what I was going to ask and just say, to answer whatever you're comfortable with, because recognize an open session and you and I are both individually recognizing that, that how the institutes synergize and connect with this evolving precision medicine initiative is a lot of uncertainty, but we're all thinking about it. But relating to Borwinkle's question, do you, th so uh, there's two parts. One, what is NHLBI thinking about at the moment, how they're going to take a program like TopMed and synergize it with the Precision Medicine Initiative? And then second question is, will that be an organizational framework to address what Borwinkle just asked? I mean, will, will that become a place that more institutes will gather to figure out how to do the kind of studies that our institutes are comfortable with? And I, I don't know the answer, but I'm just curious yeah, no, I, that I, much I, thought. I, both of those questions. Yeah, no, I, I think we, as um, uh, both ICs and, uh, quite frankly, with uh, Eric D. Uh, in play now, uh, in place, uh, I think uh, we've at least had some preliminary discussions that PMI, um, as you know, was initiated as really a disease agnostic uh, platform. And so I think it then, and, and, and it's making um, uh, important advances in that space, uh, I think the, the, it's, it's 
fullest potential, I would say, though, relates to not only be, being a disease agnostic platform, but being able to link to ICs to ask specific uh, questions that are clearly more phenotyped disease specific. So I believe, and I have to defer to Eric, uh, that it'll be the synergies of those that, that, that uh, will be important. And so I agree with you, that's an, an a, um, opportune place of convergence, I think, for ICs around PMI, certainly speaking for the NHLBI, um, it's hard to conceive of health systems uh, coming up with even a half million people where heart, lung, blood, sleep phenotypes aren't going to be very common by definition. And so I'm hopeful that there are things, quite frankly, this institute has done probably with Emerge and some of the others where uh, there are EMR phenotypes that we can do a deep dive on in PMI as it matures that we can ask at a scale that uh, I probably can't do through the community-based cohorts and that I think could complement what we're going to have in top mid. So that would be my hope, speculation. And I think it's a win-win with what Eric uh, Dishman wants to do with PMI. Uh, and from my perspective, a lot of this is just going to be depend on timing. You know, I mean, the, the sooner it is that there's things there that we can, that it, it, the precision medicine is sure that we can build a project on, people will be there. I yeah. mean, and I think you, and people will be there in a disease-specific way, people will be there in a technology or fundamental questions we have around genomic medicine implementation. Yeah. A lot's going to depend on, on what the timing looks like. Okay, so Sharon and then Dan. Th thank you for the presentation. To just follow up, I think, on one of the early questions, um, one of the things that NHGRI is now doing is really looking at the return of results, uh, of genomic results, to a number of subjects in a variety of these different uh, um, consortia. Um, and I was wondering, given really the scope of sequencing that's going on, uh, funded by NHLBI, um, are some of these projects returning specific results, and is there a group looking at that, which again could perhaps synergize with some of the NHGRI consortia? Yeah. So, so again, another great point, uh, one where clear synergy has to happen, where, again, this institute has thought about it uh, long and hard, and we'd want to lean in uh, to that domain expertise and understanding. Uh, I, um, I would certainly agree. Um, how can I put this? Um, that uh, there are opportunities to, to get a strategy on this uh, that Top Med brings to the surface. Um, you can imagine that was a hodgepodge of studies and cohorts. Um, we actually lack a coherent way of doing this. And so um, even though we're generating all this data, uh, I, I'm not so sure that there is a coherence across all those studies. And I think, again, there's an opportunity for uh, NHGRI to, to provide some uh, trans NIH leadership in helping us do this in a thoughtful way. And clearly, you guys have been thinking about it for uh, a long time. So we look forward to that collaboration. So thank you again, Gary, for that summary. Um, I guess I have three sort of pretty specific questions just sort of to clarify or to help us think about so how do we can all work together better. One is, um, do you have a timeline for when, when you know, an initial set of results might come out of this? Because I think the, the public is getting a little tired of the promise of genomics and, and it would be lovely to, um, and, I, and I, you know, I, I say that because there's a big investment. We all know that there is progress, but do you have a timeline for this? That was question one. The, question, the second question was, um, among the cohorts that, that you've accrued, some of which are ours, thank you, um, uh, do you have a sense of, of how broadly phenotyped they are? So, you know, in an ideal world, they would have phenotypes beyond heart, lung, blood, and sleep, but they would also have cancer phenotypes, they would have eye phenotypes, they would have mental disease phenotypes, and some of them will have some of that. And, and to the extent that they do, that, that would be really interesting in terms of the kind of uh, network diagram that you actually showed. And then I had a third question, and I can't remember what it is. Okay. But I think those, those are, the two are plenty. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, given that both of us are over 50, I'm, I'm having trouble remembering your first over one. Over 50? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's Trying to be nice charitable, to friend. Anybody all day. <laughs> 
Um, but so, so uh, two good points. The, the, the second one first, that um, I'd agree that um, th that obviously these studies started off with a very hyper focus in heart, lung, blood, sleep. Some of them even more hyper focused than that. Uh, the, the the cohorts over the years have been broad, but uh, I shouldn't speak out of school. But you know, even the cardiovascular ones probably could have thought about lung phenotypes better than they did. And 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 quite frankly, given that those are comorbidities, some of our lung cohorts uh, could have thought about cardiovascular phenotypes a little bit better. Uh, in many ways, this is an opportunity to, uh, for us to, to, to get some greater coherence there. As we mentioned with the other ICs, um, uh, to the degree to which uh, they put skin in the game in the cohorts to extend that phenotyping, uh, again, there are synergies that um, I think there are things we could be doing in dementia. Indeed, we're planning to do in dementia, uh, dementia uh, w whether Alzheimer's disease per se or related disorders. Um, there are already plans afoot uh, to include more PET scanning, for example, in, in our cohorts to, to, to tap into domain expertise uh, in terms of dementia outcomes. So I agree with you, uh, it, this uh, presses the issue that we need to extend beyond our classical uh, phenotypic, uh, phenotyping uh, regime. Um, and I've already forgotten your first question. Was a, was a was a timeline question, and my third question. Yeah, I, I wanted to avoid. Was, the, huh? was the, the top the O in top med stands for omics, but this is mostly genomics right now, isn't it? Or am well, I? Well, no. So we're, so we're encouraging um, trends, and and obviously we went with the technology that's you know ripe and ready to go, but the intent is actually built in that as um, you know ability to. Uh, characterized DNA methylation continues to expand or any other epigenomic uh, analyses that scale, um, we, we're, we're interested. So, so it's already built in that we'll be looking at that and uh, certainly RNA-seq is uh, to the extent we can extrapolate from blood, you know, but so, so we want to pursue those as the scientific question makes sense, absolutely. Uh, timeline is tough, um, you know, um, so, so when are you going to discover all the variations of, you know, long QT and, and you know, it, it, it comes back to you uh, about uh, how quick you can discover things. Obviously, we're hoping if we get to 60,000 whole genomes, we'll have a sense of, you know, whether this is a strategy that uh, we, we double down on or not. Uh, and. Uh, that's almost a matter of a pipeline issue and an analysis issue as, as anything. Um, and uh, as you know, we have a built in a lot of traits already that you'd think should yield us some information in a relative short term. That's what we're hoping. And quite frankly, in collaboration with Genome, um, it, Eric, it's okay, it's public as to what phenotypes you're starting with or no? Yeah. So so. Yeah, so, so those are, you know, cardiovascular, you know, phenotypes. And so I think there's a lot of, again, uh, complementarity uh, that uh, we, we hopefully will, will learn some things about. Certainly the early MI one, I'm intrigued on because if we get a non-lipid, I, I, you know, I'd kiss you, Dan. Uh, so <laughs> okay, I'll please change the subject. <laughs> No, no, I, I'm expecting the same response. <laughs> <laughs> that, although I can't offer that kind of science. But I, I do have a question, I'm, I'm, and I, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, it's really interesting. Um, I had a question about when you talk about your cohorts, whether they're all already collected and whether they are existing in one space, whether they're um, the data from them have been deposited in dbGaP or or whether there are some things that so you're going to you're going to go back to some of the cohorts and ask for additional permission to do uh, a, you know additional um, both data and and genome uh, testing yeah. so and so that I'm sorry it seems like a really fundamental question you might have already covered it but you yeah, know it's it, it is an uh, important one and actually it does have some challenging nuances to it that um, so, so all dbGaP, um, to get into top med, uh, there was screening of the consents to, to, to make sure that uh, uh, they were uh, pretty compliant and, and we actually had to screen out a lot of things that uh, wouldn't make the grade. But that being said, 
um, as you, this institute has been exploring, um, you know, the, the whole genome sequencing data set and whether that aligns with what was contemplated in a consent, you know, from 10 years ago, even as broad as it may have been, uh, it, one could um, make the case that that's something we, we continually need to think about, that consent's supposed to be a, a living process. And so I appreciate the ELSI uh, component. I think those are things we have to continually uh, bring to, to bear. And so uh, uh, we're open, and again, I think it's a point of, of collaborative synergy to think about um, if you start to put this stuff in a cloud, um, what, what, what do we need to do to, to, to make sure we're doing that responsibly uh, and consistent with the participant wishes and consent? So I still think there's a lot more to be explored and refined. Okay. I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll get Adam Felsenfeld to come to the podium. Um, and in a very complimentary talk that we scheduled deliberately after Gary's to describe uh, the opportunities for synergy between our genome sequencing program and the TopMed program that you just heard about. And I, again, I think at the end of Adam's presentation, there will be more time to talk more specifically about those connections.